it seems that for many of the great feasts in the church, the enemy does not sleep and tries to form some, some sort of a, like a counter celebration, like a counter hero. Uh, so for, for Christmas, unfortunately, Santa Claus has kind of become the antithesis, the main focus, dare I say, almost the enemy. Uh, of, of Jesus being born on the feast day, you know, that the focus is more on Santa Claus than, than on Jesus. Uh, for the feast day of all saints, we're only focusing on saints, we're focusing on demons and witches and all those kind of symbols of death, almost. Uh, it's a, a bigger thing in, in, in the States than it is here now, but like for, for Easter, there's a focus on a bunny that lays eggs. I, I, I don't really understand the concept. Uh, I don't think such a creature exists. Uh, but anyway, Easter one. Um, thank God that ridiculous tradition hasn't really come on much over here. But uh, there you go. So, uh, for Feast of All, All the Saints, it's just important that we kind of get back to basics of so often in our faith. Uh, we have to get back to the basics of, of, of what it's about, you know? It's amazing how how much we can take for granted in our faith and then before you know it we might come to discover that there's actually very little foundation to what we believe because we've just been doing things kind of automatically or kind of instinctively or just culturally and then we realize there's no foundation but it's very very dangerous to have a weak foundation or no foundation in our faith because then as my generation saw in a particular way if our foundation is weak or non-existent it takes very very little just to knock someone's faith over entirely. You know, some, some well-informed uh, Christian from another denomination comes over and says, you Catholics believe that you're a Pope, can't make a mistake. Uh, did we, no, uh, maybe, is that what we believe? Maybe, kind of, yeah. No, sure, the Popes have made mistakes all over the centuries. Like, you know, all the Crusades, it's so it's ridiculous to believe that the uh, Pope can't make a mistake. I mean, sure, that's, that's just that's entirely historically rubbish. And then you've got your average Catholic on I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. I suppose I suppose I paid this rubbish yeah. <laughs> In two sentences you've just completely knocked them off the horse. Because we don't know our faith like. We don't know it. So anyway, uh, just when we get back to the feast of, of, of today, right? The feast of all saints. Feast of all saints. I love this reading. This reading, the first reading I've had in the book of the Apocalypse, it's the kind of thing, uh, and it was very well read by by our dear Ashley, but it's the kind of thing that you could really dramatized because like, it's it's just it's just incredible. Like the reading itself is amazing. It kind of almost shouldn't be read by one person, it should be read by a whole group because uh, it's there's a, there's so much going on and it's 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 a prophetic vision and it's a vision that represents the reality of heaven again in as much as human words can describe it. Because human words are always fall short of describing heaven. But uh, I just I, I love the, the, the symbolism and the um, you can almost hear the the, the mysticism the, the joy the glory of of what's being described here. Then I heard how many were saved, one hundred and forty-four thousand out of all the tribes of Israel. That's a symbolic number. Before we go thinking one hundred and forty-four thousand, fat chance of me getting <laughs> so, I mean, this. Well, it's five million people on the island of Ireland, only 140,000 of us are going to be saved. That's a population of the earth, and then multiply that by all time, sure. Because there, there is a certain denomination, which shall remain nameless, which believes that only 144,000 will be saved. No, at 12 tribes of Israel, right? Uh, 12 is a symbolic number. 12 apostles. So 12 is like it's a number of fullness, of wholeness. Like we'd say, for us, the decimal system has, has kind of it still has symbolic numbers, like he's going 100 miles an hour, or he's a millionaire, no one ever says he's a 900,000 air. 900,000, yes, it's good, like, I mean, it's not, a million, like, it's a million, you know, uh, and like 100 miles an hour, it's, um, we might be like those kind of big round numbers, right, so they're kind of symbolic numbers that you've reached, once you've made your first million, it's, it's, it's a milestone, okay, so for them it was 12, so 12 uh, things in, Thought of as good in multiples of 12. 144 for those who are maths, 12 squared, 12 by 12 is 144. So 144,000 is 12 by 12. 
by a thousand, which means a huge number. It doesn't mean 144,000, literally. It's a huge number. The fullness, 12, by the fullness, 12, by a thousand. Okay, so it means there's a huge, huge uh, number of people. So, kind of a, a number impossible to count, but just a, a vast number. And uh, even the, like, the next line says so. After that, I saw a huge number of impossible to count of people from every tribe, race, language. They were all standing in front of the throne, in front of the lamp, dressed in white robes, with holding palms in their hands. They shouted aloud, Victory to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. And all the angels who were standing in the circle around the throne surrounded the elders and the four animals. They prostrated themselves before the throne and they touched the ground with their foreheads. I mean, just like the reverence, like the reverence of all of this. Even the angels, do you know? They're not like, you know. I'm with him. <laughs> it's like e even the angels are bowing down far as the floor, like uh, worshiping God. The words of men, praise and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. I mean, you can imagine the whole crowd going, like, You know, just the whole, like, it's just, it's epic. So it's kind of epic scenes, you know? Uh, and then the, one of the elders then spoke and asked me, Do you know who these people are dressed in? White robes and where they have come from. I answered him, You can tell me, my Lord. You can tell me, my Lord, is um, a very discreet way of saying no idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so I answered him, uh, You can tell me, my Lord. Uh, then he said, These are the people who have been brought through the great persecution, and they have washed their robes white again in the blood of the Lamb. So this huge crowd, they're all wearing white. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's symbolic and it's, uh, almost counterintuitive, okay? They're wearing white, but they've been washed in blood, which isn't white, right? So it's, it's this huge crowd of people who are roaring out these praises to God, <clears throat> joining their prayer with the angels, are all wearing white, all of them, which means that all of them got there through the mercy of God. All of them. No one earned heaven. Heaven is a free gift. It's given to us. It's given to us. It's given to those who want it. But all those who get there have been washed clean in the blood of Jesus. So it's 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 a blood <clears throat> that purifies us, but leave it. So it's not obviously we're not talking literally here. You, know, you get to heaven and somebody take a shower of blood. Of course not. Uh, it's it's symbolic, but it's, it's it's that Jesus, the shedding of Jesus' blood, is what purifies you. The shedding of Jesus' blood is what makes us capable of getting into heaven. The shedding of Jesus' blood is what paid for our sins to get us there. That way, our, our, our stains, our dirt, our, our, our shortcomings, they are washed up, paid for, and washed in, in the blood of Jesus. It isn't, so it's a free gift, as, as we said before. The, the, the gift is free from our sides, and we get it for free. But it costs Jesus his life. It's not free from God's perspective. It costs Jesus his life. It's free to us. This is love. The self-effacing, self-giving love. You are so loved, I pay your debt and I just give that gift to you. Now, <clears throat> it can be difficult for us to get all of that to our heads or to keep that in mind in real life, you know, during our ordinary, everyday, humdrum situations of, of bills and work and kids and pick up and school and hurdle training, football training and karate training and ballet and gymnastics and guitar practice and, and mail orders and uh, bills to pay. You know, just that, that's, that's daily life. So it can be difficult to keep these heavenly realities in our head during all of that because the spots have to be peeled. I mean, the sausages have to be gotten up in the freezer. I mean, like, stuff has to be done. Uh, so it can be difficult to keep in our heads the heavenly reality that we're called to and what it's worth to get there. There's a parable told of a king who was newly inaugurated or crowned, as well as one would say, uh, crowned uh, king of his kingdom and he decides to have an amazing, splendid, royal gala, a gathering, a feast for open to all of his subjects. So, uh, this homeless guy gets an invitation. He hears his proclamation being read out. 
saying, hear ye, hear ye. <clears throat> King William uh, now declares a feast for all of his kingdom. <clears throat> all are invited <clears throat> to the castle to celebrate with him. So the whole was nice in the corner. Fantastic. Free meal, sounds good. So uh, on the appointed day, he turns up at the gates of the castle. There's a huge crowd of people and they're getting in slowly. And his turn comes, so he gets in, like this, you know, flags and, and it's just all, you know, like everything's just so kind of beautiful and joyful and everyone is like having a great time, it's free food, it's all something. And then you realize that people are actually uh, being allowed into the, the inner court where the king lives. So I think it's just great, right? Cute, just like everyone else, so he queues up. And he sees that as people are getting to the top, they're actually giving the king gifts. Gifts? I don't have anything to give him. So his turn comes and and he says, uh, the king says, my good and loyal servant, you are very welcome. Uh, and then the homeless guy reaches into his pocket and says, I haven't really got anything. Um, except he's got a bag of grain, right, which he's been kind of chomping on. And then kind of reaches in and well, I give it all, I'd have nothing. Checks out one of the corn or grain. And the king says, Thank you. And oh, you're welcome. And, and, and he moves on. <clears throat> when he was leaving the court, then, he reached into his pocket again, took out his bag, and saw inside that one grain had turned to gold. And he just thought, one grain turned. Why didn't I give him everything? Why didn't I give him everything? This is how it works with God. Whatever we give to him, you see, we get back a hundredfold for all eternity. But that can be difficult to remember in the ordinary things of life, that whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm asked to do, whatever tasks we have to do here, there are tasks you like, there are tasks you won't, uh, clean floor, clean toilets. There are tasks that people will find difficult, uh, you know, but we do them out of love. And to remember then that, that whatever we do out of love, we get back a hundredfold, like, and then, and then, not just a hundredfold, but for all eternity. Even like, this this reading from the book of the Apocalypse, you've got this great scene, as I say, the angels and, and the, the, the huge crowd and all, like, and all calling out all these uh, chants and glories to God. And then, in my own head, maybe it's just me, but I imagine it's great. What do they do afterwards? You know, after the celebration, what do they do then? Like that was that must have been great, like for 20 minutes, half an hour. And then <laughs> then what? Do you know I think it's just maybe it's just my overactive imagination, like but but um I can't imagine doing anything for more than you know two or three hours before it starts to get a wee bit. What's next? <laughs> You know, like so, it's very difficult for us to imagine God, even God's presence for all eternity, being enough to satisfy me. Because there's nothing on earth, nothing on earth that satisfies, that satisfies us for more than two or three hours before you get tired or you need a break or you're hungry or whatever. It is. Even like Chinese, like we all love Chinese and stuff, big fans. Uh, but you know, I mean, if you're going the way through, looking into your bowl or dish, going, Jenny, can I actually finish it? Like, I mean, I'm actually, I'm good now. So, it's like there's nothing, there's nothing on earth, nothing, nothing that satisfies us for eating more than a day. Even if you go on holidays, like if you go to Spain or something, and you're there on a beach, oh, this is fantastic. And then it comes like two or three, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, gee, that's it's boiling. Like, I just, I don't know, I just, I, I think I'm going back to the hotel, that's it's air conditioning here. I'm, I'm, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing like, Whatever you like, I mean, even going to a match, I mean, everyone goes to a match, they roll around, it's all good, and then I just, alright, that's better, throw it, better get the kid in the traffic, on, 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 you know, and like, even that, like, it's like, you know, we better get going, I don't be stuck in the car all day. So, like, there's, there's just nothing, nothing on earth that satisfies us for more than a couple of hours. So, it's difficult for us to imagine heaven being enough for all, even God being enough for all eternity. 
So maybe that's why the, the Catechism doesn't really say a whole lot, like, because it just, it's just way beyond anything we've ever experienced. You might have heard of <coughs> Pascal, Blaise Pascal, a rather smart chap uh, from France back in the day, who apparently actually had a wee bit of an issue with gambling. Okay? But he was a man of faith as well. But he came up with what's called Pascal's Wager, which I'll elaborate slightly on to make it a bit easier to understand. And he was talking about like, the idea of faith. So living a life of faith. What if it's all made up? What if heaven isn't real? What if God isn't real? And so being a man who was somewhat taken by a fair wager, uh, he logically calculated that it worked out. Okay? So say we believe in God and we live accordingly. So I believe in God and then I live a good life because I believe that God sees what I do. So it matters what I do, even the stuff that isn't visible to others, what I think. Holding on to resentment, holding on to hatred, no one sees that. But God does. So I, be I believe in God and I live accordingly. If heaven is real, when I get to heaven. If I, if I believe in God, but I don't do what he says, well then, if heaven is real, I don't get to heaven. Okay, now, if God isn't real, if God isn't real, but I believe in him. Now, because I believe in God, who isn't real, well, I, I still, I'm still trying to obey his commandments, I'm still trying to be forgiving, still trying to take care of my neighbor, still trying to be faithful to my wife, still trying to be, you know, a, a good and loyal father, not just always follow my passions or my hobbies, I'm trying to do that because I, know, I think God sees me, but he doesn't actually exist. Now, when I die, they'll pop me into a hole and I won't know the difference. But, because I've lived a life like that, I've actually created heaven here. I've been a better father, citizen, worker, husband, everything, because I believe in God. So, his wager is, if we believe in God, uh, uh, as, as understood by, by our Christian faith, uh, if I believe in God, we don't lose. If I'm right, I gain heaven, and if I'm wrong, we create a better world here. So his, his argument is that it's actually, it, it makes sense to believe in God and to act accordingly. And this is becoming a saint. In the everyday experiences, to be the best, the best you that you can be. That every moment is important, <clears throat> every action is important, and be the best you that you can be. You're not called to be another Mother Teresa, another Padre Pio. You're called to be the best you that you can be. Because Padre Pio was, was a relatively enclosed, and he's religious. You're not, so. You can only imitate so much of this life. God's calling you to be a saint. You, as you are, where you are, now. And then when all the dust has settled and when all the, the sands of time have passed and when our lives here are over, our hope, our belief is that we share in this glory that we have read. Read about in the book of the Apocalypse. For all eternity. It's it's astounding. It's incredible. It's just it's so beyond my words. So let's not be afraid to give God everything. Because whatever we give to him, we get back a hundredfold for all eternity. Amen. Mm -hmm.